Order, order. Good morning. I am Natasha Brown, the Chair of the Youth Select Committee. Can I welcome you all to the second and final session of our committee's inquiry into a curriculum for life. This inquiry was inspired by the UK Youth Parliament's debate in the House of Commons. We are looking into the role of the education system in supporting young people in the development of life skills. Please could everyone ensure that mobile phones are turned on silent and that there is no photography or video taken during the session. This meeting will be live tweeted, so please feel free to join in with the hashtag YouthSelect. Can I welcome our first panel of witnesses and thank them on behalf of the committee for taking the time to meet with us today. Could we please start identifying, by identifying yourself for the record? Shall we start with Lisa? Um, yeah, I'm Lisa Nandy. I'm the Member of Parliament for Wigan. Um, and I'm the Shadow Children's Minister with responsibility for looked after children um, and child protection in particular. I'm Sharon Hodgson, um, MP for Washington and Sunderland West, um, <coughs> Shadow Children and Families Minister with responsibility for um, uh, Sure Start Early Years, Child Poverty, Special Educational Needs child and Child Care. Yeah, I must have missed <laughs> that one out. Um, so, yes, uh, I'm very pleased to be here, first time. So, be gentle with us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll start with our first question from Nathan. Good morning. Um, we've heard uh, quite a lot um, over the past couple of weeks about uh, education and where it should be best placed, but um, to what extent do you think the responsibility for supporting young people to develop life skills um, is with the education system as opposed to other influences like parents and outside organisations? I'd like to start with you, Lisa. Um, yeah, OK. Um, I think that it has to be a partnership. So very recently we proposed through the Children and Families Bill that we wanted to see sex and relationships education as part of a broader PSHE curriculum on the national curriculum. Um, the reason that we did that is not because we think that parents don't have a crucial role in equipping young people <coughs> with the skills and knowledge that they need um, when they, as they grow up and, um, and when they leave school or formal education, but because we think that schools have a really strong role as well. Um, and in fact, the view of parents seems to very much reflect that, that actually they would welcome a bit of assistance, especially with difficult issues like sex and relationships, education, um, and see it very much as a partnership. And finally, I would just say that um, for some young people in particular, this is absolutely essential because where their parents can't or won't help them to navigate some of those really difficult issues, it's essential that they have access to that education somewhere, yeah. and that's why the role of schools, in my view, is absolutely vital. Great, thank you. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, Lisa's um, said everything uh, and covered it in her answer. It definitely is a partnership. I don't think it is um, totally the role of parents or totally the role of mm -hmm. education. Um, for the, the reasons Lisa gave as well, that you know, if it was totally left up to parents, some children would get a pretty raw deal. Um, and some aspects of it, it's probably better handled at school amongst peers and with teachers as well um, than it is at home. Um, all sorts of, you know, n not just um, sex and relationship stuff, but, you know, all, all other aspects as, as well that you can just think of would be better in a group debate where those things can be talked about, where sometimes parents would just be too uncomfortable and wouldn't, you know, and the, the, ch the young person wouldn't ask the right questions of their parents as well, where they would in a, a group setting at school. So I think it, it is, it's a partnership. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we have a question from Joel. Hiya. Um, Mr Stephen Trigg, MP, suggested to us that the curriculum needs to be broad, broad and balanced to support young people in their careers and as active citizens. In your opinion, are schools delivering a broad and balanced curriculum? Um, and I would say that the picture is mixed. I think there are many schools who are doing so, and I think there are other schools who aren't. I think the, the, the crucial thing for me is that many of the reforms that we've seen over the last three years have made it more difficult for schools to do this. And I think it's very unusual to go into a school and find that all they want to do is teach a very narrow academic range of subjects. But actually, with the introduction of measures like the EBAC, for example, schools are being pushed down that route, which largely I think they don't want to go down and that we think are unhelpful for children. 
quite recently I visited Singapore with the Education Select Committee, which I was formerly a member of. Um, and Michael Gove, the Education Secretary, is very keen on Singapore as a model um, because they tend to get very high academic results. What we found when we visited there was that they were increasingly recognising that they were equipping young people to pass exams, but they weren't equipping young people with the skills that they needed for life. And we believe that what you learn in school is not just about passing exams, which is incredibly important, but it's also about equipping you with the skills that you need for life. So we'd like to see much more freedom granted to schools to be able to focus on those aspects of the curriculum that are really, really important to their students. We don't see why that should only be um, extended to academies and free schools. We think that should be extended to all schools. And just to give you an example, in my constituency of Wigan, um, payday lenders have sprung up all the way down the high street in the last few years. In fact, even in the last few months, we've seen a huge rise in the, the number of um, of loan sharks um, operating on the high street and obviously a lot of the children who are in schools in Wigan are going to have parents who are going to those payday lenders getting into all sorts of problems devastating for the whole family we think it's really important in areas like mine where that is becoming a real and pressing problem that schools should have some freedom to be able to focus on those aspects of the curric curriculum that are really really relevant to pupils um, the pupils in the classroom in front of them. Yeah, <clears throat> and also Stephen talked about, um, you know, that the curriculum should equip children with knowledge, skills and resilience. And I think, you know, we all agree on the knowledge and skills and where the balance of that should come from in academic and more vocational subjects. And I'm hugely worried about the lack of art, craft and design education. I chair the all-party group for art, craft and design. And it, the, the number of art teachers losing their jobs or not being trained anymore is you can measure it since the introduction of the EBAC because what's measured by schools in the EBAC table is what schools will value and will think is valued by the Secretary of State and then encourage the children in that direct direction and we're seeing that. So, um, so knowledge and skills is one side of it, but the resilience is the other side. And the, as Lisa said, the skills for life, it's so important that that is part of the curriculum as well. And that, that's not just assumed that the skills for life, um, in one respect, will come from the parents, which I think perhaps Michael Gove thinks, you know, that doesn't have to be dealt with at school. It isn't time, you know, and if a child... Um, comes from a good family then they'll get that from home but as we know not all children will get the opportunity at home and home isn't the best place for some of it. Um, he talks about wanting to create active citizens as well and this is a hugely important part of what I think um, the curriculum should be about as Lisa's talked about the financial education. I mean the, the list that um, we understand as being under PSHE, political education, sex and relationship education, cultural awareness, community cohesion, finance skills, sustainable living, citizenship education. They, they're all huge and important issues. And if there was just time given to this one subject on the curriculum and it was mandatory, it, it would be quite a busy lesson because you'd have all that to cover, plus a few other areas that probably during the course of evidence I'll, I'll touch on. But um, yeah, I don't think what curriculum at the moment could be said to be broad and balanced in the, the full sense of um, our discussion today. Okay, uh, and briefly, could you ex um, explain on your experiences how far do you think the education system has progressed in terms of supporting young people um, to develop the kinds of skills that will help them later on in life? <laughs> and, well, I think that um, one, of the, one of the really positive things that happened under the last government was um, the development of the Every Child Matters agenda, which placed a focus on children as, as human beings in the round um, and not just as, um, as, uh, <coughs> through the lens of education and particularly academic education. Um, so I think that's been a, I think that was a huge step forward, um, and I think that that enabled schools to um, to look at young people as the individuals and citizens that they are, um, rather than just focusing on the education side of things. And I think actually in my experience that was particularly helpful because it freed up 
teachers to be able to concentrate on education when you had lots of other support for young people outside of the classroom. It meant that teachers um, weren't dealing with the sorts of things that they are now, now that that support has, has largely disappeared. Um, so I've shadowed a teacher recently in a school in North London um, and I was really surprised to find that they were dealing with things like they sent in pest control to a child's home, um, th paid for through their school budget because the, they had mice in the house and the child didn't want to go home, was upset at school. They were dealing with the impact of benefits changes, particularly on single mothers um, and the impact of the benefits cap. They were dealing with children coming to school too hungry to learn um, and too tired um, to cope. Um, around half of children in Greater London and half of children in Greater Manchester now are growing up in poverty, so they are arriving at school without having had anything to eat. I think, I think we've made huge strides forward, but I suppose what I'm trying to say is that I think that we are doing a lot of children and young people in this country a real disservice at the moment. Disservice in terms of their lives generally, but I think that's having a real knock-on effect on their education as well. And with regard to later on in life, I mean, that's when all of these you know, other skills, soft skills, that resilience is, is what you need. It's not just about packing your brain with, with knowledge and facts and figures that you can regurgitate. It's about the whole person. And one thing, uh, now might be as good a moment as, as any, one thing I'm trying to persuade um, our party and then, you know, the academics um, wide, more widely it, to have on the curriculum is child development and with regard to the brain development, and I've got a couple of props, if I may, Chair. Um, Graham Allen, I don't know if you've seen this report, Graham Allen did um, early intervention, and he's produced two reports, and I've got a photocopy of these, the front of the reports, to show you. That's a picture of the brain, obviously, I don't know if you can see it, but there's two brain photographs. Now, I don't know if any of you know, and you're aware of this report, what's the difference between the two photographs, is one younger than the other? Are they the same age? What are they, you know, anybody got any clue what the difference might be between the two photographs? Well, they are both of a three-year-old child, and this one is a normal brain of a child that's been nurtured, loved, and cared for properly. And this is the photograph of a three-year-old child that has suffered extreme neglect and hasn't been nurtured and loved. So that is the effect that neglect has on our brain, and that is very, very difficult, almost impossible to reverse. The brain grows um, the most during the first three years of life. And all the connections that we make in our brain, the majority of them will happen within the first three years. You know, we're born as a, the human race with a very um, underdeveloped brain, because it has to be that size in order for us to be born. Um, and so a lot of our development happens once we are born. And I don't think, I don't know if any of you knew this, but if you don't, that is worrying in itself that you've been all the way through school and haven't learnt this. Now this is important because if you weren't from a family where you were nurtured and you had that experience of knowing what a good upbringing is and knowing what it is to be loved and nurtured, you won't have it in here. So you won't naturally be able to empathise and to give it out. So I believe part, instead of always having to fix the problems when young people who weren't nurtured properly then go on to become parents and, aren't, and the cycle repeats itself because they parent in the way they were parented, we need to fix it in here. We need to educate about the importance of the first three years, how important they are. What, what, and it's not about encouraging children to be parents. It's not about teaching parenting, but it's about teaching child development and brain development. And I think this can be slotted right the way through the curriculum in science, you know, with all of all of this, but also from the early years in nursery, where um, when the children's playing with the the pushchair and push, you know, and you push the baby in a pushchair facing away, that they said, oh no, use the one where the baby's facing you, you know, so you can look at the baby and talk to the baby. So all those messages are just sort of, oh, don't let the baby cry. Go and pick the baby up and give the baby a hug. Why don't you sing to it? So that can be in the nursery. And then obviously that wouldn't work with teenagers, but, you know, teenagers can be taught about <coughs> brain development. One little thing I'll do is this. There's a guy called George Hoskins from the Wave Trust, and he produced a report. The Wave Trust is excellent on this work. He produced a report called... Um, um, conception to age two, the first thousand and one days. 
and basically you know if you want to explore this further look it up and he always does this and says in the first thousand and one days we make a connection in our brain every second one connection every second and that is the you know the biggest growth in our brain so it, when a baby's sitting there and people think it isn't learning anything it is you know if you give a baby a fright it'll go like that so okay. I think that needs to be taught. Yeah. So I'm j I just thought I'd, <laughs> I'd slot that in there for you all to yeah. think about. Thank you. I think we have a question from Matt. Um, yes, Sharon, I'd just like to pick up on something you said earlier about um, the training and demand for art teachers. And I was just wondering if, you'd, um, if you could make any comments about the training and demand for teachers of uh, lessons such as PSHE and citizenship, which our committee is obviously looking at. Um, well, I know the citizenship the PSHE Association rather, um, you know, do a lot of work in this regard and they, you know, they've got sort of um, a curriculum, you know, to, for initial teacher training ready to go and some, te you know, some um, teachers do choose to be, to become PSHE teachers and to be taught. Um, so I think it is important that, you know, obviously um, teachers are taught how to do this properly, but I don't think that the lack of, you um, a teacher, say, in a school having learned about PSHE and their initial teacher training or CPD should stop them being able to start to deliver PSHE. Because some of it is, you know, it, it is common sense. I, know, I don't know if you've seen the debate Baroness Massey did in the Lords. If you've followed it, you can pick up the Hansard. It was on um, the 24th of April and she had a full debate on um, PSHE. And she talks about this and she says, you know, that teachers don't need to have necessarily, although it would be preferable to have been trained, but things such as kindness, working in teams, listening to others, thinking about how to help one's, how one's behaviour affects others. Teachers are able to help children to gain, gain confidence in their own abilities. All of that, a good teacher will be able to do without necessarily haven't been taught it but I think that would be preferable and if we do have it eventually as a compulsory subject on the curriculum we would hope that initial teacher training and CPD it would would cover it. I would um, just like to pick up on what you were saying about that um, although training is preferable it's not necessary. Um, we've heard a lot of evidence that suggests that actually perhaps for a lot of the subjects or the topics within PSHE it could be necessary because of some of the, the degree of sensitivity um, in some of the things that are being taught. How would you yeah. respond to those suggestions? No, I agree, absolutely agree. The, the point I was making, it shouldn't be seen as a barrier, which I think sometimes it's used, oh, well, we can't because nobody has been trained in it. You, you know, some of the, the areas, I totally agree with you, it would be preferable for, some, for people to have been trained exactly how to deliver this. But some of it, you know, can be done through the skills that teachers have anyway. But, you know, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. OK, thank you. Thank you, thank Chair. Thank you. Um, Chair, could I just very, very briefly, briefly add something to okay. refuse briefly. the question? Um, just that one of the reasons that we think it ought to be on the national curriculum is because when we were in government, we were really concerned to find in a piece of research that we commissioned that only 28% of primary schools and 45% of secondary schools had a teacher with a qualification in PSHE and we think if you put it onto the national curriculum it gives it a status that it doesn't otherwise have and that's the way to make sure that schools give it priority. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your answer so far. We have a lot of questions to get okay. through and only a limited amount of time. Can I ask the, committee, the committee to keep the questions short and for witnesses to keep their answers <laughs> short also. Thanks. So we have a question from Sam. What are young people in your constituencies telling you about their expectations and experiences of life skills provision in schools? Would you like to start yourself, Sharon? Um, I, I think a lot feel they don't get enough, or if indeed any, um, political education. That's the, the, the key one. I'll, I'll leave Lisa to do the sex and relationship stuff. But um, yeah, that's what I pick up from a, a lot of young people. They don't understand, for instance, the difference between the, the political parties and they wish that had been taught in school. You know, they might have a school council and they get the concept of voting and all of that. Um, but what it's all about, the, the, you know, what the actual difference between the parties is, and they feel that that could be something that was taught in a non-biased way, that they would then just understand what the difference is instead of leaving and then they're faced with this choice and they don't have a clue 
how they're supposed to make that choice unless you know they just vote with who their parents voted for. Um, that's one of the things I've Thank had. Um, I think, generally speaking, in Wigan, the feedback that I get about what the curriculum that's followed in schools is very good. So, for example, in my area, we do focus quite a lot on issues like debt and money management. We do focus on issues like cookery because obesity and ill health is a, and heart disease is a real issue. Um, we do a lot of sports and we use sports. Some of my schools, like Abram Guest, for example, use sports as a way into formal learning for young people who otherwise wouldn't be um, ready or able to cope with more formalised learning. So I think generally speaking the picture is good um, but of course there's always you know there's always more that we could do I think um, and it's about trying to find time in the school day and find creative ways to teach these things through more traditional subjects as well. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we have a question from Solomon. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask the, the panel, I don't mind who answers, uh, in terms of the, the freedom that a school has, to what extent should the, should the school curriculum be down to, to, to schools? And will that actually enable uh, life skills to be provided at a better... Um, well, we, we think that it doesn't make a lot of sense at the moment that you've got some schools, academies and free schools, who have more freedom to depart from the curriculum than others. So what we'd like to see is that all schools would have to give due regard to the national curriculum, but they would have some freedom and flexibility to decide what they taught, how they taught it, and, and how much emphasis they placed on different so, sorry, subjects. Sorry, so schools should have more time to, to, to arrange their own curriculum? Yeah. Okay, and that's still, you still believe that even though you're saying that um, PSHE should be a statutory subject that schools should be teaching? Yeah, and we've, we've picked out PSHE and sex and relationships education in particular because we think this is so, so important. Um, so we supported the government putting financial education onto the curriculum. In fact, we pushed very hard for that. Um, but we think that a broader PSHE curriculum really, really matters, especially at a time when education is becoming more narrow. And we think that certainly in the schools that I visit, the mark of a good school is that they do have that um, emphasis on a broad and balanced curriculum and equipping young people with the sorts of qualities that Sharon talked about, about confidence and resilience and life skills. OK, thank you, Joe. Thank you. And a question from Physics. Um, to what extent do you think that the um, kinds of things covered by PSHE or life skills provision um, should be delivered through core curriculum subjects um, such as maths and science, or do you think it should be um, covered in a dedicated and separate programme of work? Well, some of it can be. The, you know, the, my idea about sort of. Um, <coughs> child development, brain development, you know, that could be in, under PSHE, but also it can be slotted in mm. to, you know, science and to, um, you know, all of the, lots of other aspects of, of the curriculum. And the same could be said for the financial education, could be slotted into maths or into um, economics class. Um, you know, there is lots of other play, and I think that should happen as well. I don't think it's an, an either or. Um, it, it can complement um, what is happening in the PSHE lessons and then you can see the relevance of what you're being taught in PSHE in the other areas of the curriculum. So I think you know, it, it isn't either or, it can happen in both. Um, the only thing I would add to that is that um, there are some quite innovative ways that different schools are approaching um, delivering some of this as well. So I recently met with Southlands High School um, who are working with the Debt Advice Foundation um, and what they do at Southlands is they train 14 to 16 year olds to go into their local primary schools and with the supervision of, of qualified teachers they deliver those lessons to to younger children and that seems to me particularly interesting because the 14 to 16 year olds are learning quite a lot as are the primary school children and what they what they reported to us is that the children are more receptive um, to hearing about how to manage money from somebody who's closer to their own age um, and has been through their experiences very recently. And um, we've heard a lot from witnesses about um, how, how to manage um, students not in traditional education um, particularly from the young people we spoke to how would you deal with that and also make um, life skills accessible to those regardless of ability um, well one of the things that the the southlands um, 
example that I gave in Chorley has done is to adapt um, the the uh, materials that they use and adapt the lessons that they teach for children who've got special educational needs and I expect that Sharon would probably want to say a bit more about that but I think that um, I think you have to recognise that not every young person learns at the same rate or in the same way and good teaching will always take account of that. Just uh, one thing that's slightly probably outside of the remit of your inquiry but I think is interesting is that in some countries they don't teach by um, they don't teach by age group, they teach by ability group and that has particular, particularly good outcomes for looked after children and children who are in and out of the formal education process because of disruption in their wider lives and seems to also be quite helpful for other young people. So, you know, part of us saying that we think that schools should have more freedom is because we've learned from elsewhere that that can be very, very helpful for all young people, but particularly for the most disadvantaged. Mm. The, the only thing I would add is um, there's an, an excellent anti-bullying programme that is, hasn't been introduced in England or Scotland yet. I know it's just getting introduced into Wales, but I would recommend that this is something else that could be included in PSHE, and it's called Kiva, K-I-V-A, and it's from Finland. And um, basically, it's, it's about educating the whole school and educating um, everyone that the bullying is in their hands too, whether they allow the bullying to take place. So we are all, if I was bullying Lisa and all of you just watch and let me do it and don't intervene, then you are all as bad as me in a lot of ways. And so this is what this programme Kiva teaches. It's about, and, and the, base, the reason they do it is cr to create good Samaritans, good citizens of the whole school, that that then is skills for life, that then when they go out into the life from school, they won't walk on by. And that, you know, it's teaching intervention and sort of getting away from, oh, you mustn't tell, you mustn't tell. So I think that, you know, for a lot of children who are excluded because of being bullied, um, you know, a way to tackle that is if we introduce this programme into PSHE. Thank you. We have a question from Daniel. Start. Would you say that devolution has benefited the education system of the UK or do you think it's resulted in some inconsistencies across the country? I think, I think one of the inconsistencies is what I've just highlighted. Mm -hmm. I know that this bullying programme is now being taught and used in Welsh schools because um, uh, one of the, uh, an academic from a university in Wales found out about this programme, recommended it to the Welsh Government, and it's now happening. And so it's not happening in England and Scotland. But So I suppose there's innovation, that's a freedom and flexibility you know, that the, the devolution has brought about. But it means that there isn't the consistency either. I, don't, I'm, I mean, I'll be completely honest with you, Dan, but I don't really feel qualified to fully answer mm. that question. And it's a shame that my colleague Kevin Brennan couldn't be here because he is our Shadow Schools Minister, but he is also a Member of Parliament in Wales, and I think he would be a lot, a lot more eloquent on this than, than I can be. But what I would say is that I think it's really, really important that we learn from our neighbours um, and take the best of what's happening in other countries and bring it here. Not to cherry pick things that have no, no real application in a UK context, but because we do a lot of going around the globe looking for examples of good practice from really countries very far afield, Finland, Singapore and elsewhere, but we don't do enough, I think, about learning from our neighbouring countries. And just in my area of particular responsibility, looked after children. I recently visited Scotland where they're doing some very interesting work um, supporting looked after children, which is having a knock-on effect on their educational outcomes. I think that we should do much more to, not to sort of stifle innovation and creativity, but to learn from it and make sure that we use it. Thank you. And a question from Kerry? Um, I guess that's Isabel's main point about the how you'd make sure the education system reached everyone. Yes. We've heard a lot about the curriculum and how it would work within the school setting, but how would you ensure that children who are, say, homeschooled benefited from this life skill provision? Oh, gosh, this is quite difficult. <laughs> um, OK, so I think... I think, the, I think that the main point that I was trying to make in response to Isabel is that, um, that you, have, you have to... Be, good teaching has to be able to adapt to different young people, to their needs and to their circumstances. 
Um, and one of the reasons that we think that it's not helpful to be overly prescriptive about what schools can do um, with the children that are in their classroom, or as you rightly point out, who are not in their classroom, um, is because we think that there has to be that flexibility to be able to adapt to those children's individual needs. If you have a class of young people who have ha many of whom have English as an additional language, you might choose to teach that class differently or structure your arrangements differently with the use of classroom assistance or others than you would with a, a, a class full of children who didn't have English as an additional language. So I think, I think the flexibility point is the most important. But we think that the national curriculum is a resource there for schools, that if, that if you have a good national curriculum that schools can use, then they can adapt it to the needs of individual pupils as well um, and, and make sure that it's taught in a way that's appropriate. So the example that I gave of Southlands um, is, is one of those ways that you can do that. Um, like Kerry, I'm not an expert in, in homeschooling or how um, the, the parents who homeschool, how they sort of um, obtain their resources and their teaching materials or whether everything is done sort of at school or whether they do take part in group um, teaching sessions with other children who are homeschooled. I would imagine that might probably be the case, but again, I've got no... Um, knowledge of this and so you know if they, the teaching materials are adapted and this is included and it's in the national curriculum they would receive it in order to then um, homeschool their child um, and if they take part in any group sessions and that was felt that this you know the SR, the sexual relationship stuff was better done in a group session with the professional and um, delivering that then they would access that in the way they perhaps do at the moment perhaps for science lessons and uh, practical things such as that. Again, I'm not an expert in homeschooling, so I, I, I don't have an understanding of how um, they do it. You know, again, Kevin Brennan probably would have been the better witness for that question. I think just, just to add to that, I may agree with that, but I think also to say that um, there is a bit of a gap emerging at the moment because of the centralisation of schools um, and the removal of that, that local authority oversight, which is of concern to us. So, Bringing, bringing education much closer to Whitehall I think has been unhelpful for that because particularly for parents, for example, who homeschool their children, the local authority in many areas provided a really good resource to be able to support that. And the other thing, of course, to add to this is that inspection is really important and getting inspection right is really important because ultimately that is the only way that you really know um, when you look at the outcomes for young people and you look at the inspection reports that Ofsted does, that's the only way that you really know um, whether young people are getting a decent deal or not. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And a question there from Matt. Um, yes, yeah, so I'd just like to uh, ask about the uh, reasons behind the new Clause 20 in the Children and Families Bill, which would have seen PSHE become a statutory requirement. Okay, um, yeah, so um, we are increasingly concerned about um, young people having the skills and the knowledge and the confidence and the resilience to be able to keep themselves safe. And I say that not because I think it's just the responsibility of young people to keep themselves safe, but because empowering young people to be able to reject unwanted advances um, and, um, and protect themselves from exploitation is really important. As you'll know from recent court cases around the country, the most recent one in Oxfordshire, um, this is a real, real problem facing not just young girls, but young boys as well. Um, we were really concerned by research that was done by the Deputy Children's Commissioner, which found that an astonishing number of young people, both boys and girls, don't know what a healthy relationship looks like. And that was backed up for me by a visit to Bradford very recently where I met young victims of sexual exploitation who impressed on me the importance of having access to this sort of education in schools. Um, we think it's really important because we think it, that it stops young people from being exploited, but it also stops young people from being becoming perpetrators themselves. The NSPCC found that a third of girls um, aged 13 
to 17 had experienced physical or sexual violence in relationships and a YouGov poll found that a third of 16 to 18 year old girls had been subjected to unwanted touching at school. Um, so we think it's really important that both boys and girls know what a healthy relationship looks like, know what, where the boundaries are. We, we think sex and relationships education is important but I want to put particular emphasis on relationships because I think that is absolutely essential and that's where we feel there's a real gap at the moment. Um, and how would you evaluate the reasons cited by those who opposed the, the clause um, in saying that they felt that it would take away some of the, the flexibility of schools um, and families and wider communities to, to act um, on these issues? Well, like 98% of parents who in a recent Mumsnet survey said that they would be happy for their children to attend sex and relationship education lessons, we think that this is a partnership. 92% of those parents thought that SRE should be compulsory in secondary schools and 69% thought it should be compulsory in primary schools. So we think there is a lot of strong support from parents out there for this. But we have also said that if parents feel that it's inappropriate for their particular child for whatever reason, given that parents are usually the person who knows that child best, then we think that they should be able to retain the right to withdraw their child from those lessons up to and including the age of 15. Um, but we think this is really, really important and we want to see every young person have access to it in school. Okay, and um, lastly, do you believe there would be any disadvantages in having um, statutory PSHE in our curriculum? I think, the, I think the, the problem with just saying you make it statutory and then you solve the problem is that you clearly haven't. So there's a, the first thing I think that is really important is that it's high quality um, and that um, and we've learned, I think, from the introduction of citizenship education that where schools really got behind it and they wanted to deliver it, it was very high quality and where schools didn't, it wasn't. And young people tell me this all the time, that they've had really, really mixed and variable experiences of how you do it. So some of the things that we were talking about earlier, um, about training, but also about kind of school ethos is really important. And there's, uh, some of the schools in my constituency are UNICEF Rights Respecting Schools, which you may know about. I think that's a fantastic programme um, that helps, it involves young people in the running of their own school. It's kind of citizenship on the job. And I think similarly with SRE, um, it's not enough to say make it statutory and therefore you've solved the problem. It's got to be really, really good quality and that does mean that teachers need to be trained in how to deliver it, but it also means that schools really need to get behind it um, if, if it's going to be a success. Thank you. Okay, and uh, thank you. And now a question from Izzy. Um, please, you talked a lot about ensuring quality of yeah. PSHE education. We, um, we heard from Janet Palmer, the uh, HMI for PSHE at Ofsted, yeah. and she said that in the future there will be no specific subject-specific inspectors. Mm -hmm. how, will we, how will you try and ensure quality of P PSHE education without this resource from Ofsted? Um, well, I suppose I would say that that is a concern because inspection is one of the key ways that you, um, you, can, you can see whether it's being delivered um, successfully but also uniformly um, around the country in different schools. So that is something that is of concern. Um, the other thing I think is that you need to make sure that teachers are qualified, like we said, um, that schools really get behind it, that the curriculum is very imaginative. Um, but I would say that inspection is important. Um, as with anything that you do in schools, I think the views of children and young people are really important as well. So what I would like to see is schools regularly um, evaluating their own performance in relation to sex and relationships education to see whether children and young people themselves feel like it's making a difference. And I think these are these are often quite tricky topics. So um, when you when you learn about them in a group discussion, often young people won't feel able to share whether they found that helpful or not. Um, so making sure that there's a mechanism for them to feed that back afterwards is really important as well. Okay, thank you. And a question from Nikita. The proposed clause on PSHE was defeated in the Commons, short of making it a statutory, statutory subject. But what do you think the government should do now to embed life skills provision into the curriculum? Well, 
they should have accepted the amendment. I know um, it's now in the House of Lords, and we're hoping we'll get more success in the House of Lords. They're often able to win votes a lot more successfully than we ever are in the Commons, just the way you know, we've got crossbenchers and they're perhaps not whipped as ferociously as we are in the Commons. So um, it, it's had its second reading in the Lords um, just this week, Tuesday, and then it'll go into committee in October. Um, and it's a grand committee, it's a committee of the full house. So any, um, unlike in the Commons where you know it was a committee of just 20 of us hand-picked who were interested in it, um, it'll be the whole House of Lords, so any member can put amendments down. And there was about 60 spoke, 60 um, peers spoke in the debate. And you know, if all of that 60, and that could be just a limited number, there might have been a lot more who wanted to speak. Um, I haven't analysed how many spoke specifically on PSHE, um, but you know, I'm sure one of your clerks would do that for you if you wanted to. You um, could find out which peers um, to lobby. And you know, hopefully they will pursue this. They might be able to overturn, get new clause twenty or whatever number it'll be um, in the House of Lords, and perhaps have a successful vote on it. And then, obviously, you get the ping pong. It will come back to the Commons, no doubt. Um, perhaps the government would overturn it again. But it gets more difficult for them to keep overturning it if it then goes back in the Lords. Put it back on, um, you know, and it, it, the, there's a strength of feeling from the upper house that this is something that really should be on the curriculum. So, you know, you could all take part in the lobbying of members of the House of Lords um, if, if you wanted. I think, as members of the Youth Select Committee, they would certainly listen to your view. So, I encourage you to do that. And just very briefly to add that uh, the chair's looking, looking daggers at me, um, <laughs> <laughs> just very briefly to add that uh, I think this has to be seen alongside what's happened to youth service provision as well. And what we're really concerned about is that this support is disappearing outside of the classroom at the same time as the government is sidelining it inside of the classroom. Um, so I think you have to see what's happening with the curriculum in that context, that young people who would perhaps have gone to a youth um, service provision and learnt some of these skills, now many of them don't have access to that either so um, that's one of the reasons why we tabled new clause 20 and why we'll be returning to it as Sharon said um, after the recess in the House of Lords. Thank you. Thank you and final question from Karen. Um, on the practical day-to-day -day side what problems do you think teachers are facing at the kind of grassroots level to deliver PSHE skills? Well I suppose it's materials if um, you know there, there probably isn't a, a whole wealth of, of materials they can use to deliver this. The fact that they haven't had initial teacher training on this or CPD because you know it's not um, a compulsory part of the curriculum. Um, obviously I think there's excellent materials around delivering um, the financial education. Um, you know there's organisations that you know have pr produced excellent materials on that that will help deliver. I know the elect um, Electoral Society produced excellent materials to help with um, you know, political education around citizenship and, and voting. Um, and I went around my high schools, I, I got a load of the packs of, it was, I think it was called um, um, election cookbook, something like that. And I got a load and I went around my high schools and delivered them, but you know, one per high school. Um, you know, and it, it, it was a really, really good resource. But you know, did they get used? Is one enough really? Um, so yeah, there is an issue around resources and that's until it's seen as something that's valued and measured and perhaps compulsory. There, there could always be this dearth of resources. It really does depend on the leadership of the school, the leadership from the top, i.e. Secretary of State, um, and then the leadership within the school, which can make up for a dearth of leadership from the top. Um, if you've got a good head teacher who believes this is important, you will find the resources. And, it, you know, very um, adaptable teachers um, is the other, the other way where they can, you know, find the resources when they, they don't exist. Um, and I think one last thing I would mention is an example from my constituency. We've got Castleview Enterprise Academy and where they've created sort of, because it's said that in the North East there's a lack of entrepreneurialism traditionally because we had the heavy industry, and I know Samantha's from the North East, that we had you know, heavy industry, the, um, the mines, the shipyards, and that people just became employees. 
and there wasn't this entrepreneurial spirit, spirit and I think we're challenging that now and you know I, I don't think you could say the same and in one way of challenging it is what this school has done they've created sort of a whole enterprise culture and they've got sort of a high street almost one corridor that you walk down they've created shop fronts and in the lessons the children produce things you know in the craft lessons and art lessons all sorts of lessons that they then you know sell and there's this culture of sort of it, there's another primary school did this I can't remember the name of it he created the, the primary school he made it like a town and the whole he ran it through the whole um, school so there was the town council, there was the mayor and maths lessons. It was all about running the finance of the town. And he took a school that was failing to outstanding without concentrating and focusing on Ofsted and Sats. He just concentrated on running this, in getting the imagination of the children and using this town concept throughout the school. And the school went from failing to outstanding. So I think you can be innovative and that's up to individual heads. I would just add that I think that the demise of a lot of the partnership working at a local level has been really, really difficult for schools. Um, when this government came to office, they dismantled a lot of the structures that previously had existed, certainly in my field in relation to child protection. That has been a real problem because with the demise of children's trusts um, and the lack of requirement now to participate in things like local safeguarding children's boards, it's very difficult, I think, for teachers on the ground to know who to go to for help and advice. So Sharon talked about materials, and I agree with that. And it's also about knowing who to go to for advice about these issues. So when you think about sex and relationships education, an essential tool in school proactively to prevent harm from being done to young people, not even just to stop, stop it happening, but to prevent it from happening in the first place. It's very difficult for teachers to know who to pick up the phone to mm. and call. And what I think we need to urgently do in this country is to knit that framework back together because, um, because my sense is from shadowing teachers on the ground and from visiting schools in my constituency is that that has been really, really problematic for them. It's taken away, um, it's taken away a lot of the tools that they use to keep children safe. Um, and so the sooner that we can put some of that back together, I think the better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there are any points that you'd like to make which you haven't already made, um, could you briefly make them and say maybe one thing you'd like to see as an outcome of our inquiry? Would you like to start this? Um, uh, I think we've probably pretty much covered it. I suppose I would just say as an extra thing to emphasise this point about the involvement of children and young people in anything that's going to be effective because in the design, the implementation and the delivery and in the assessment. In my experience, that is the only way that you can, um, that you can bring to life a curriculum that's relevant to children and young people in the lives that they're living at the moment. And so I'd like to see a really strong emphasis on that um, from the inquiry. Um, and obviously you are all young, um, but you know, involving young people as well, other young people in your inquiry, I think, if you've not already done it, I'd love to see some of that. I think it's something that we um, in Parliament aren't good enough at, even on the Education Select Committee that I used to sit on. I don't think we were good enough at doing it and I think it would be great to see you guys leading the way on that. Okay, thank you. And Sharon? Um, a, a, a couple of areas we, we haven't touched on. Um, I cover um, underage drinking, teenage pregnancy um, issues such as that and I think that's a huge area that can be covered under PSHE um, and sex and relationship education particularly with the, the teenage pregnancy and a huge part of um, from talking to young people I've had a few round tables um, where I've asked young people why they think the teenage pregnancy figures were not tackling them in this country were still one of the highest in the whole of Europe and it always comes back to the young people don't you know they, they understand about condoms they know how they get pregnant but they don't go out intending to get pregnant or even to have sex but then that's where alcohol comes into it and after they've had too much to drink you know the the sex happens and then the pregnancy follows because it was unprotected sex and that's such a, a worrying um thing to hear from you know is is a is a parent and is a you know a, a politician and how how we tackle that and the only way I can say where we can tackle it is through education and the obvious place is PSHE um, you know to to make young people more alcohol aware and you know about the safe limits and about what can then happen when you know and some of the adverts we've had uh, the, the 
you know, the, the, those sort of adverts where you, the, the girl is getting ready in reverse. Um, you know, I've seen that one. I think they're quite powerful. You know, would you, would you go out like this? So why do you come home like this? And I think they're really powerful of the effect. But obviously the other side of it is, you know, you can come home pregnant and not even know it. The other thing is internet safety as well. That's a huge, hugely worrying thing. The grooming on the internet, um, the um, the sexting and, and all of this. Is it called sexting? I think it is, yeah. Um, you know, and that, and just making young people aware that they do not have to take part in this and to sort of encourage them to resist getting into to any of that and where it can lead. The internet's forever and once something's out there, you know, as much as somebody will say, oh, don't worry, I'll delete it, we know it doesn't work like that. So I think that is very important. And, sense, and it's a sensitive subject. Parents, you know, parents won't have a clue where to begin with any of that because we're from a different generation. So again, that's something that needs to be done with people who are educated and know how to deal with it. Okay, thank you. Um, also, um, Sharon, we're asking if it would be possible to have a copy of the report you showed us yes, because yeah. some of the committee were quite interested in that. Oh, um, so we'd much. like to thank you again for your time. Order, order. Order, order. Can I welcome the SECO panel of witnesses and thank them on behalf of the committee for spending time to meet with us today. Can you please start by identifying yourselves to the rec for the record? Yep. Yeah, uh, good morning. My name's Rob Wall and I'm the Head of Education and Employment at the CBI. Hi, I'm Grace Breen and I'm Policy Advisor for Education also from the CBI. I'm Jeff Thompson. I'm Executive Chairman of the Youth Charter. I'm Tracy Bleakley, I'm Chief Executive of the Personal Finance Education Group, PFAG. Thank you. I start by asking, we've heard a lot of different suggestions about what life schools means and what should include, so how would you define it? Do you want to start, Tracy? I think for me, um, the role of education is to prepare young people for life. And at PFAG, we talk about young people needing the skills, knowledge, attitudes and confidence to be able to manage money well. So we're looking at it from a financial education perspective. It's really important to have those underpinning, um, un the underpinning facts and figures and the knowledge, but young people also need to know how to apply that and how to figure out where they stand on certain issues. So to give financial education as an example, we put the, what we call the objective side into maths, so that's financial literacy. The nuts and bolts, how do we do the calculations, the knowledge and the skills if you like. But then in PSHE and citizenship, we talk about the more subjective side. So how do I feel about money? What are my values? How am I going to make decisions in my life? And how am I going to plan throughout my life? I think the two sides are really important. And I would say that from a life skills perspective, that's the balance that we need to have. So it's skills, knowledge, attitudes, and confidence. Thank you. Jeff? Um, the Youth Charter's experience is every child matters. Every child, young person or citizen is gifted and talented and has the rights and responsibilities by way of those gifts and talent to be able to develop and achieve in life. In order to do that, we believe that cultural activity is a good way of engaging young people and equipping them with the confidence, the belief, the identity and the ambition and aspiration that they can then compete in life because the world is a competitive place. And in their communities, we believe that if we can equip them and enable them, that they can start to apply educational confidence, community abilities to understand money, how they earn money, how they make money, and how they save money. And I believe that that has to be delivered in a holistic and integrated way. And our programs are designed to culturally engage, motivate with skills for life, and hopefully inspire an entrepreneurial spirit that can see them contribute for themselves in the wider community. Thank you. Ray? So we're both coming from the same organisation, so we've obviously got the same, yeah. same approach. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, life skills isn't a term that, that we actually use within CBI. So, um, you know, we believe that the education system needs to deliver young people with the tools that they need to succeed at school, at life and in work. So we tend to talk more about the, the behaviours, um, the characteristics, the, the attitudes that young people need to succeed. 
life skills is certainly part of that, but, but we see it as, as part of a bigger whole. Okay, thank you. And a question now from Nikita. To what extent do you think that young people are being effectively equipped with skills needed for later in life to be rounded employees and active citizens? If I could start with Rob. Sure. Um, the truth is we don't feel that young people really are being given the chances that they deserve. So we publish an annual skill survey that looks from an employer perspective at uh, the skills and experiences that young people have when they enter the workforce. And that shows us that, again, from the employer perspective, that young people are lacking some of those skills. And when we're talking about skills, it's not simply the quality of academic skills. It's some of the, the behaviours that really employers are looking for. So, uh, you know, basic skills around communication and team working, some of those self-motivation, uh, resilient skills. So, you know, the evidence suggests that actually the education system isn't, isn't really working. Um, and that's something that's a real concern to us. Uh, and that's why it's really good for us to be here today to, show, to share some of, the, some of that thinking with you. Jeff, would you like to follow up on that? I think you've chances experience and I think fully supporting the recognition of that skill stroke life gap that exists with young people being ill-equipped to compete for life. We found that once we got young people confident enough and equipped enough to compete for life, they said, where's the jobs or where's the entrepreneurial opportunities that we would like to see? And we found very quickly that the behavioural skill sets of timekeeping, communication and attitude and enthusiasm and a will to very much work hard were the things that employers were looking for and they said if you give us that we can do anything with that and I think there is a lack of a cohesive net that sees a continued journey seamless and able to properly equip young people with the ability to actually realise their full potential. Just a quick example, um, our work predominantly started on the streets for those failed by the education system and they were very effective entrepreneurs on the streets. They were in the pharmaceutical industry and I mean guarded with my words, or should I say the drug industry. And I found very quickly that there were exceptional entrepreneurial skills, they were incredibly punctual, good effective communicators, marketeers and entrepreneurs, but I feel that they were not positively contributing to the wider community. And we had them do the reverse of actually influencing their peers for all the right reasons. And we found that there was a pretty interesting mix of potential if we found they could bring citizens to their rights and responsibilities, able to respond in a behavioural responsible way. Have you seen a change in the level of importance given to life skills provision? No, I believe it's a very mixed offer, um, all too fragmented, um, where there are some excellent examples that tends to reside within, again, while well, the earlier evidence given to the enthusiasm, the leadership and the creativity of the school, who I think within the very school structures that we have create a more entrepreneurial culture as they're having to justify their existence and their bottom line are results, exam results, I think we should be looking rather more holistic look at results of how we develop young citizens for life. But I think life skills, PSHE, citizenship rights and responsibilities needs to be more centrally identified as a curriculum core um, existence and opportunity. And how do you think we could achieve a more holistic approach to life skills development? Um, in 2000 we very much looked at that. We had, with the advent of citizenship, we looked at cultural activity, sport and the arts, how it could engage young people and interest them in a subject. They were quite strong on their rights, were too clear on their responsibilities, because I believe responsibilities require decisions and choices. And as a result, we identified a curriculum learning experience that could engage the cultural activity, youth-wise, but at the same time, give the subjects of debate, discussion and decision as to how programmes and projects could be actually delivered. And we then got a whole school, whole year approach, which developed some very interesting links with the wider community who I have to say have to be part of that intergenerational link beyond the school gate because I believe there is again a lot of social, cultural and enterprise um, asset that can be used to the benefit of the school and the community as a whole. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question now from Nathan. Yeah. Uh, this is for you as well, Jeff. Um, you undertake regular work with uh, young people. Um, do you think you've seen a change in the way um, importance has been given to like? life provision in schools and outside the school gate as you mentioned? Yes, there is, a, there is a big difference and I think it's about language, culture, communication, the lack of it, the need to have in a very interactive mobile lifestyle 
social media, of so many different forms of um, communication, something that all aspects of this particular effort can become collectively contributive by way of knowledge, skills and sharing best practice. Again, going into schools, it seems to be a very insular, sometimes outwardly looking, but mostly insular because the pressure is to deliver the results and the targets. And I think that does in some way stifle creativity. And I think there is where the problem lies, where we have state, free, academic, private. I think there needs to be something that gives some cult, I wish to see a cultural um, offer that transcended all learning um, structures and that can provide beyond the school gate some opportunity of creativity for the private sector playing a major role. How do you think we could achieve this? Um, Manchester's a pretty interesting place um, and um, we, we evolved out of the bidding, hosting and legacy of major games but having that multi-agency stakeholder relationship of public, private, third sector and community sector with young people having a very, very involved um, role at the planning, at the preparation, in the execution and the sustainability of whatever was agreed, we found that we could socially broker with young people playing a part and taking responsibility for the part they play, a very, very, very exciting mix of ideas, innovation and opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And a question from Matt? Um, yes, Jeff, you mentioned the, um, the sort of the, the pressures of uh, academia and academic results um, by way of sort of comparison to this life skills sort of provision that we're looking at. Um, do you believe that there's a, a, a flaw in the system of examination for academia that needs to be addressed as well? Um, or is it simply elevating the importance of life skills? I think it's a question of raising the elevation of, of life skills. If you don't have the confidence, the aspirational belief, belonging and identity of what you can be and how you'll be able to achieve that, I think the core curriculum requirements become uninteresting and they become a pressure just reading about the stress being encountered by young people who have so much pressure coming from so many different directions. I think being able to give them a focus and a disciplined um, behavioural approach that gives them some confidence and trust in what they're doing to make decisions is where it's currently, I think, slightly seeing the gaps appear. I just met some young people who've just finished their exams. They're, they're, they're ready for having a very extreme form of relaxation, as we all would. But I think very much the case is how we support them. And I think the, the private sector have an important role to play. And the vocation training and college environments, further education, I think that's where we need to be more integrated and more cohesive. But at the moment, I'd say we need to focus more on how we develop the personalities and the characters that can then apply the read, write, count, result, and then take that forward beyond the school gate. Thank you. Thank you. And our question from Isabella? Um, this is particularly relevant to Rob and Grace, but we received written evidence from an entrepreneur who said that young people were arriving at his business ill-prepared for the world of work and life in the workplace. What have businesses been telling you about how young people are ready for work or not? Our experience is similar, so, so businesses are telling us the same really. Um, as I mentioned, we, we run an annual survey, which we're happy to share with you, that looks at the specific issue around education and skills. And perhaps we can just share some of those headline stats with you. Yeah, so um, in terms of young people being prepared for work, um, from the employers that we surveyed, 32% uh, of them weren't satisfied with literacy and numeracy. But at the same time, that was not their key priority that they were looking at when they were looking at recruiting school and college leavers. The main priority for employers is actually attitudes to work. And 78% of those that we surveyed said that that was the most important factor they looked at, um, which was followed by general aptitudes uh, and then literacy numeracy and academic results as what employers looked at actually came in fourth place in terms of priorities when recruiting school leavers. I think that really highlights you know, how employers view things and it is not just about the exams, it's about the development of the whole person and it's the rounded, grounded individual. So that reinforces the discussion here really that employers are valuing those, those life skills, those wider behaviours and often putting it ahead of pure academic qualifications. Um, and I'm not sure that message is really getting out to schools. Um, some people we heard from believed that the best way of ensuring that a suitable emphasis was put on life schools was that was to make it an examined subject as well. What do you think? Would this have benefits or not? That's, that's not our approach. I mean, before today, I, I sort of read through 
our three submissions and I think one common element was that actually we all agreed that life skills, employability skills, these wider behaviours need to be mainstreamed into the, sort of the core learning and the core teaching. It's not an add-on, it's not a nice to have, it's, it's really integral to the whole education experience. So, so that's very much our approach and I think if I'm not misrepresenting it's the view of us all. Thank you. Thank you. And now a question from Solomon. Thank you, Chair. Um, sure, Tracy, I'd be delighted that finance and employment education will be part of the citizenship curriculum. However, I'm interested in the, uh, the panel's views on what difference they think that will uh, make, if any, to, to young people and schools. I'm happy to start with, with Tracy. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we, we hope it's going to make a huge difference. Um, I'd echo the point that Lisa Nandi made, which is that the curriculum is the first step. And now what we need to focus on is giving teachers the skills, knowledge and confidence to be able to teach well. Because what we're taught from young people is that the difference between a good quality financial education and a poor quality one is actually how engaged the teachers are and how relevant they make those teaching experiences. So when we talk to teachers who haven't had any training, they say to us, well, we're very good at managing our own finances and we're not feeling very confident about things. And, and we worry about different young people in the classroom feeling bad because they've got different income levels. And we're not very sure about financial products. So it doesn't take a lot of training, but giving that training, whether it's in initial teacher training or in CPD, makes a massive difference. We'd also like to see financial education in primary schools as well. Uh, the Money Advice Service in Cambridge University recently did a study to show that most of the, the main habits around finance and, and how you manage money are developed by the age of seven. doesn't mean they can't change, but it's harder. So that's things like um, counting, knowing that different size of coins doesn't mean the coins are worth more money, being able to plan for the future, understanding there is a future, and that there, there's a difference between the things that you need and the things that you want, and you might have to make choices and save up for things. All of those develop by the age of seven, so we're really pushing for mandatory financial education. is that education not in, in maths, or do you, do you want that within...? It's, in, it's going to be in the curriculum now for secondary schools, but not for primary schools. There's a little bit in maths at primary schools, but nothing in PSHE or citizenship that's mandatory, so we'd like to see that in there as well. But one of the things I'd say is, um, I'm talking about financial education here, but financial education, especially in the PSHE side, is where young people develop a lot of these life skills. The kinds of projects that they do help them to develop presentation skills, critical thinking, communication, working in teams. Enterprise is another example of a subject that does the same sort of thing. So the more that we see of this in schools means that the more young people will get the opportunity to develop these skills and attitudes going forward uh, through their school life. I just wonder if I can ask Grace as well whether that sort of proposed framework covers the kinds of, uh, the kinds of things that, that's, that you want to see. So our kind of focus when we look at the curriculum is on English and maths as a core. And it, yeah, the inclusion of financial education as part of the maths curriculum is very welcome. Um, but the way that we look at it is that the curriculum should be minimally pres prescriptive and that teachers are professionals and should be able to exercise their professional judgment and where they have the opportunities to innovate within the curriculum, they should be able to do so. And I think these areas that you've identified as life skills, you know, the employability are ways that teachers can innovate and deliver a more engaging curriculum to young people. So should this, um, the move to citizenship uh, for, for finance and employment, should this be done with political education, cultural awareness? Yeah, I would absolutely agree in that. One of the things, looking at it from a financial education perspective, is there's a lot of discussion about what young people need in terms of education. A lot of discussion about how difficult it is for young people now with the economy and the set of circumstances that you're all inheriting and how to make financial products more relevant for young people. But I never see young people in the room. I never see young people as part of that discussion. It's all adults trying to determine what young people want. I want to see much more of a youth voice and that's where um, other things like political education can really, really help because we need your voices in policy making because young people have got new ideas and they're facing these set of circumstances, they're very real for them. So I would agree political education certainly is very important. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And now a question from Matt. Um, yes, Tracy, you uh, made the point a minute ago about the curriculum being the first step, which was something you echoed from what Lisa Nandy said earlier. 
Um, do you believe, and this is a question actually to the whole panel, that the um, the the skills that you are um, expressing concerns about, do you believe that they should be underlined in statute, or should there be um, this assumption that it will be dealt with with the flexibility in the school system that is existing and being encouraged? I think it's important to come up with new and innovative ideas about how to get training to teachers because they're really, really busy. You know, we're facing tough economic circumstances at the moment. There's a lot of schools and a lot of teachers out there. 11 million young people are in school at the moment. There's about 40,000 schools across the UK. So we're looking at different ways of helping teachers, whether that's getting into initial teacher training colleges, and we're working with 16 of those at the moment. So if the trainers understand how to train, the new teachers coming through will have the confidence. Looking at continuing professional development doesn't have to take a lot of time, whether we can do best practice conferences, online training, videos, support that way, and whether schools can help each other as well. So we've got this concept of centres of excellence, which is there a school that says financial education is absolutely critical for our young people as a life skill, we'll embed it across our curriculum, and then we'll go out and help other schools in the area, creating sort of informal networks and clusters helps the teachers because they're getting career development and leadership development from doing this but it also helps in quite a cost effective way getting that training out to schools as well so statute yes in terms of we need to say that all teachers need to be trained but I think that there can be lots of good flexible models for being able to do that thank you thank you and a question from Carrie this idea of getting young people more involved in actually the decision making rather than adults trying to decide what needs to happen for us. It's all very well for us to sit here and say that, but how do you think on a grassroots level that can actually be, be achieved? Well, one of the things that we've done is we've created a campaigning toolkit called Our Money, Our Future. Financial education goes on the curriculum from September 2014, but we wanted to give young people the opportunity to lobby their school earlier and campaign to say, we want financial education, we think it's really important. And of course, as Lisa and Andy also mentioned, academy schools don't have to teach financial education, well, they don't have to teach the curriculum. And 57% of secondary schools are now academies and free schools. So by having this pack that young people can download for free, it gives them the opportunity to go into their school and influence what's taught. This summer, we're also creating some youth networks as well, so that PFEX work can be informed by young people, not just in England, but also um, in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as well, and looking to do that. But I'd really like to see a way, that, uh, just a more formal way that young people can put their ideas more into policy making as well and get those ideas to financial services organisations, the people that put the products together, the people that make the decisions about wider things like the economy and how we're tackling the economy. So I'd really welcome other people's views in how we do that because I think it helps everybody. Thank you. And now we have a question from Daniel. Yeah. <coughs> This is for Jeff and Tracy. Um, what are teachers in schools telling you about difficulties, any difficulties they may have in providing life skills provisions for the young people in schools? Most teachers walk a very politically correct and eggshell um, fraught um, journey in their everyday school environments. Um, as I said earlier, the young people know their rights, sometimes their responsibilities, but I think it's the teachers who are most confused. I think there is also a lack of confidence in how much they can impart or share as part of that debate, discussion and dialogue. And I think that in itself has seen young people leading the debate and taking a more decisive leadership role in what might shape a discussion, an idea and the taking forward of that idea. I do think, and I support Tracy's comments and views with regards to teachers actually being better equipped and given the confidence. I think there's a lot of um, demotivated teachers there at the moment. I think it's how we give them back their rights and responsibilities to help lead the delivery of this agenda. I also think teachers need to become coaches. I think the term teacher is not applicable for the young people. They need to prepare where young people would lead them. They can then enter into, I think, a two-way learning relationship. Just to answer that from a practical perspective as well, one thing that certainly head teachers are telling us is that schools have so many different priorities. It's really helpful if Ofsted inspections make financial education and life skills a priority. 
Now, in the past, economic well-being was one of the things that the Ofsted inspections tested. That's been significantly watered down, and although head teachers really want to make sure that financial education is embedded across their school, they've got to focus on the other priorities. So, just from a practical perspective, we'd like to see Ofsted again picking up a much higher priority in terms of financial education, economic well-being, and, and the life skills agenda, and how that's being taught. And if I may very quickly just give an example of where the primary school role in all of this is so critical. St Mary's Primary Moss Side had a money week. They asked us to come along and help just engage and lift the aspirational creativity of the pupils. And at the end of the week they had a small market store culture that was very much supported by the parents and the wider community. And you saw this wonderful, creative and economically beneficial approach that saw the secondary schools in the area wanting to know how they could get involved. So we now had a primary school actually leading the secondary schools in the wider community. I think they're on their way to London now as um, the Times Education Supplement are about to look at them by way of a shortlisting for an Enterprise Community Award. And I think it's that type of good practice that can actually give some confidence as to how we make a holistic, as we say, primary, secondary, further and even higher education approach that can really start to take the public and private sector and teaching professionals with them. So despite these obvious difficulties, have you got any examples of where teachers delivering PSHE and lay skill provisions are actually quite good? Because we could maybe perhaps take these um, ideas that they have and pass them on to other PSHE tiers. Uh, so I know Malbank, Malbank, Malbank um, Secondary Sixth Form College, um, based in Nadwich, uh, have been unbelievably creative in how they take PSHE and actually have young people lead the rights and responsibilities for their decisions, their creativity, and the delivery of that in creating community, a whole community approaches that are in the classroom, in the playground, and beyond the school gate. They had very much led by where the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, how they could use the games to actually bring the curriculum alive. They did this very successfully, and with our support, they were able to look at what they'd created in the classroom and in their <coughs> discussion would see them create a community, a 21st century community that could bring all those elements and joined up approaches and they developed a youth wise community, they looked at how their skills and potential could be employed, how enterprises could be delivered and how partnerships could be developed with stakeholders and with the wider community to build their sports centres, their community centres, their churches, their libraries. But the most interesting fact on the most sensitive area of citizenship, rights and responsibility discussions are the beliefs. Um, there was an atheist, there was a Hindu, a Muslim, um, there were a whole host of belief systems, but I realised that they needed to have some common, common values of trust and confidence that would allow them to work in a very much more successful light. And it really was an inspirational experience, bearing in mind that this was an enrichment group that couldn't or was struggling with their um, curricular learning. So I can then ask um, Tracy, we've heard a lot about your oh, the PFEG's provisions, which are wonderful. Can you tell us about the, up, maybe, well not a percentage, but the uptake on this, is it quite high from schools and young people? It is, yeah. I mean, we don't, um, we don't have the facilities to go around every single school and find out exactly what they're doing, but we just ran Land Money Week, as Jeff just alluded to, in June, and 15% of primary schools and 44% of secondary schools across the UK took part, which is a really good indicator. Um, we've been working since the year 2000 and we've been working with teachers finding out how best to teach the subject. Our database of resources, lots of those resources have been developed by schools because it's really useful to take this best practice forward, you know, the innovative things that they're doing and sharing it across schools. And we got to the point last year where 94% of teachers said that they believed financial education should be taught in school. And I think that's been a, a big change over 12 years where teachers were very nervous about the subject, first of all, but they've really come round to the idea. We've worked in 8,500 schools, we've worked in every local authority, we've trained 20,000 teachers. I don't want to give you the impression it's all done because there's still a huge amount to do. Um, but I think that we're well into that journey and I think it just shows how successful life skills can be and that it doesn't have to carve out additional time in the curriculum. You can embed it into existing subjects, make the existing subjects more contextual. And just the last stat I'd like to give you 
is that we ran a survey over Easter. 90% of maths teachers came back to us and said when they teach financial education in maths, they see attainment levels in maths increase, which is a, a really good way of showing that when you use the life skills agenda to make core subjects more realistic for young people, uh, more meaningful, that it actually then increases the attainment level in those subjects as well. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. And now a question from Nathan. Yeah. This is quite an interesting one, actually, because you've all mentioned um, what schools have to say, but um, we've been told that there's an important link between life skills and future employers. Um, what responsibility do you think employers have to support the potential for future development? That's start with that one. Um, employers have a key role to play in supporting young people. Uh, both because clearly employers benefit from the talent that, that's coming through the education system, but also because businesses are part of local communities. So communities have a big role to play. Education doesn't start and finish at the school gate. Yeah. So, yep, business has a key role to play, and business wants to play a role. So again, in our survey, um, we found that I think it's over 80% of businesses now have some sort of engagement with, with their local school. Yeah. Uh, and we've seen great examples of that. So I know Grace has been to see the work that British Airways do with their local schools. Tr uh, Tracy and I uh, uh, sat in on some work that some of the city banks are doing with local schools. There's great examples up and down the country. Um, and there's a real benefit to young people because business know more, better than anyone else exactly what the market demands. So in terms of providing information uh, that's going to help you make good career choices, in terms of, I think most importantly, helping inspire young people around whether it's science or engineering, uh, raising levels of aspiration, maybe providing positive role models where they may not exist. There's a key role for business, and, and we're up for playing that role. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody else? From my standpoint, um, and I, I will take a somewhat more biased um, example of the 2012 Games, which, as we approach a year anniversary, sought to inspire a generation and whilst many people thought it was about the winning, I genuinely believe it was about the taking part. And how do we inspire young people to actually achieve in life? If they have a healthy attitude, and yes, there's some physical, artistic expression and confidence realised, but how do they employ all those skills and careers that it took to deliver those games? And I think there is some creative, knitted effort that needs to be looked at as to how we take business, who know quite clearly what they would like to do, and already being corporately responsible citizens, actually join up and make more cohesive and more importantly share the best practice. I think there is some incredible work going on but I don't think there is one platform that can actually provide the materials, the best practice, the innovative tools and skills and the ability to translate them into local benefit, national benefit and even international awareness. I think from a PK perspective, we see lots of organisations, primarily banks and financial services companies, who put together really good financial education programmes in schools. And what we do is we give them a kite mark. So we um, independently quality assure them to make sure that the teacher's always in control of the classroom, to make sure that no branding ever goes to a young person. Um, and to make sure that the materials link with the curriculum frameworks that we put together to show how financial education should progress through the curriculum. We also put their resources on a central database so that teachers can choose between them what's most appropriate for their class. So I think it's really important to have that coordina coordination so that teachers can get the best out of what's out there. Um, I would also echo the point of volunteers. I think it's really important to get that outside view as well so that young people can really question people that are actually working out there. Not just from um, inspiring people into future careers, but also asking them, well, what does a, what does a banker do? What does a stockbroker do? How, what does an accountant do? How am I going to work with you in the future when I'm an adult? And the final point that I would say as well is that um, just in terms of coordination, PFEG have started up a partnership movement called Take Charge and we've brought together um, a selection of the, the big charities doing lots for young people in terms of financial education and enterprise and we're then working with the corporate organisations as well. We're putting together a map to try and figure out who's got access to what across the country, look at where the gaps are and figure out how we can all work together, both in terms of sharing best practice so that everyone gets access to the best thinking. But also, if there are certain areas in the country, I mean, we heard about the North East, 
who don't have the provision that the rest of the country has. We're going to figure out together how we can pull the funding together, how we can work together and make sure that those areas are supported as well. So I think that's quite exciting. Yeah. Um, you also all mentioned uh, businesses, you mentioned BA and then some financial institutions that help schools with their progression. What businesses and partnerships work well in schools? What are the best types of partnerships? Because I know my school have worked with Barclays and Starbucks, but what, what, what works well? I think the ones that work the best is where the business really works with the teacher and allows the teacher to lead the learning. So I've seen um, situations where volunteers come into the classroom and the teacher goes and sits at the back and it's very much a one-off. That's great if it's a one-off subject, but what works really well is if it's a long-term partnership where the business is really engaged and they might come in multiple times to work with young people. The teacher leads the classroom and it's all part of an ongoing project. So it's young people can see where it fits into their continual learning and they can get the most out of that. And I think the other side of things is where you can link up with other things like work experience or visits as well. So it's not just people coming into school, but it's schools going out into the real world and being able to link that up. And then if you can link mentoring and coaching up with that as well, then you can build that long-term relationship in. So it's not just that sort of one-off. I think um, it's where businesses and schools really do work in partnership led by the teacher. I think we would, we would agree. I mean, a couple of principles that seem to underpin the most successful relationships are, are where there's an equal relationship between the school and the employer, and also sustainability, where it's a long-term relationship. So it's not a one-off hit, but actually there's a real commitment. Yeah. And this, this, the type of support uh, that works well is support around specialist activities. So, for example, financial uh, organisations supporting uh, products around, or you know, uh, learning around sort of personal finance, but also sharing professional skills. So it's not just supporting young people, but businesses can support teachers, head teachers, uh, they can support governing bodies. Um, but also, coming back to that earlier point about sort of raising levels of aspiration, inspiring young people, showing the sort of, the, you know, the fantastic opportunities that are out there and getting us, getting us all engaged in, in some of those areas. Thank you. Thank you. And now a brief last question from Matt. Thank you, Chair. Um, You've all spoken quite favourably about the role of business in, in educating young people in these areas of life skills, um, as have the other panels that we've heard from this week and last. We did, however, have um, one person who gave evidence uh, suggesting a concern that actually the, obviously the primary motive of, of businesses is to make profit. Um, and that actually there might be an issue with them not having the best interests of the young people at heart. Do you feel that's a concern at all? I think it's easy for us in financial education because if young people get a good financial education, they're less likely to default on loans and mortgages and they're more likely to um, buy up products that are going to minimise risk for them, things like house insurance, pensions, that kind of thing. So if young people get a good financial education, that's a real benefit for financial services organisations. They understand that teachers would never trust them if they came in and put, gave branded materials to children, but if they all work together and they all form a part of financial education, then everybody benefits. So I think that we've got quite informed um, corporate organisations working with schools, and I think it works quite well. I, I would support that concern raised, because as there is, there are great examples of where it works, there are also some concerns that young people have expressed to me in that they feel they're being already sown into their hearts and minds with seeds of expectation that in some terms might see peers see one favourably best positioned to make use of that brand and that status and all that goes with it and that can lead to bullying and it can lead to the disaffection within the relationships in the school and I think this is where the chambers of commerce can also have a role that the large corporates I think get it very much right I think we need to accept and recognise a small to medium businesses these are the businesses that are going to grow and hopefully build the economy and hopefully help meet the unemployment that currently exists in young people. So we do need to be mindful. I'd, I'd like to see a kite mark that was applicable to small, medium and large businesses. And I think it is something we need to be aware of. Young people are aware of it. So again, if they're the voice, they're the democracy and knowing what they would wish or need to have, I think we need to be mindful of it. And I think there's, there's ways to manage those concerns. So there's organisations such as an organisation called Business in the Community, which sort of act as a broker. So they're a not-for-profit who will bring schools and businesses together. 
uh, and make sure that actually, as we said before, those key principles of ensuring there's an equal win-win and it's a long-term sustainable relationship and that the young people themselves benefit and it's properly monitored and measured and assessed can hopefully mitigate those concerns. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask the panel if there are any points which they haven't made so far and would wish to do so and also any outcomes they would like to see from our inquiry? Any? I think from our side, you know, it's, it's been really interesting for us to be here and uh, we've covered a range of issues. I guess I'm quite conscious that we spend most of our time talking to employers and probably not enough time talking to young people. So what I'd really love to see as an outcome of your inquiry is a real sort of frank, candid, honest assessment of how you view education, particularly in the space we're talking about, such as life skills and employability skills. I'd find that really valuable. Okay, thank you. And Tracy, you have something? Um, yeah, one of the things that we haven't talked about in this session is what about young people that are not in mainstream school? And um, certainly in my Money Week this year, we spent a lot of time doing CPD with um, organisations like pupil referral units, special educational needs schools and young offenders. And we did the feedback last week and I was quite emotional actually when I realised what an enormous difference life skills and financial education in particular can bring for these young people because it can be the difference between independent living and not. It can be the difference between uh, believing that society will accept you and that there's a place for you and not. And a small amount of continuing professional development and teaching for these organisations goes a very, very long way in terms of helping young people. My final point, if we take one big thing away from this, and I know I keep saying it's all about teacher training or training for community workers, that is the difference between a good quality, engaging financial and life skills education and just sitting at the back of the classroom reading a document. From my own humble experience, 20 years working with young people, both in and out of school, um, supporting Tracy, that there are those who don't want to go to school and as a result of not going to school become not in education, employment and training, which I never see as neat, but a very uncomfortable situation whereas those who actually finish school are now part of a, just under a million unemployed. And I really do think this needs to be a national effort with young people very, playing a very active role. I do believe that we also need to look at, for myself, a youth ministry. We are the only country in Europe who do not have one. If we have a youth ministry, then the youth voice, ideas and leadership play a full and active role. And I would ask that you all visit a legacy manifesto, which is currently in the social space and exercise your rights and responsibilities to democracy as to what an inspired, inspired generation might look like. Okay, we'd like to thank you all again for coming and giving us evidence today. Order, order. 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 Welcome to the final panel session of the committee's inquiry into a curriculum for life. Can I welcome our final witness and thank him for, on behalf of the committee for taking time to meet with us today. We have heard a lot of different and interesting views over the course of our inquiry and we'd like to spend some time now reflecting on these and hear from the government their views. Could you please start by identifying yourself for the record? Hello, I'm Hardik Beagle. I'm the Director for Assessment Curriculum and General Qualifications at the Department for Education. Thank you. Go straight to the first question <coughs> from Nathan. Okay, good, good afternoon. Um, based on your experience, how far do you think the education system has progressed in terms of supporting young people to develop the kind of skills they need um, from life? I think I agree with previous uh, witnesses. It depends on the definition of uh, life skills. Um, some of the witnesses have limited life skills very much to PSHE, whereas I think that the legislation about the whole curriculum that schools provide has it right that schools must offer a broad and balanced curriculum that prepares pupils for the opportunities, responsibilities and experiences of later life. And that applies to all maintained schools and new academies. I think in my experience, I've worked in the department for over 15 years and visited schools throughout that time, I think schools do offer a much broader uh, curriculum with an uh, emphasis on uh, knowledge, understanding and skills. And especially those with an extended day uh, have a much richer curriculum and offer to pupils than a decade or two uh, decades ago. And I think many of them are using the additional freedoms that they have uh, to, for instance, hire a wider range of adults 
uh, into those schools to complement the work of subject specialist teachers. Okay. Thank you. And now a question from Joel. Hello. Uh, Ofsted recently reported on PSHE provision in schools, finding that provision was inadequate in 40% of schools. Um, can I ask what, if anything, struck you about uh, the findings in this report? Um, I think it's always regrettable when uh, we find that uh, a particular type of uh, education, a particular subject, that we have so many schools that are providing it not to the standards that we think we would all agree uh, people have a right to expect good or outstanding in that subject. Um, and I think the um, PSHE, like other subjects, where there have been similar findings about the percentage of uh, uh, schools and lessons which are not uh, good at outstanding, should worry us, uh, worry us all. In uh, response to their recommendations, uh, which they play, gave to us, uh, the first recommendation was around making sure the DfE made PSHE a, a more prominent uh, feature of uh, the curriculum. And you'll have seen uh, previous witnesses, uh, Joe from the PSHE Association says that he does welcome that in the introduction to our new national curriculum, we've said that all schools should uh, provide PSHE, drawing on good practice, a clear signal to schools to not uh, simply carry on with practice that's been going on in the past if it's inadequate, but actually to seek out uh, good practice. And that's at the front of the draft national curriculum, not hidden some way uh, uh, towards the back of that. So I think that should help. The second action uh, we took uh, was to uh, work with the PSHE uh, Association to grant fund them to um, further develop their work and resources for uh, teachers. <coughs> so they'll be developing their charter teacher uh, program, which hopefully we can talk about uh, a bit more here, develop their resources for uh, schools and hopefully that should uh, encourage schools to uh, use those resources, um, which I think are very good. Thank you. Thank you. And Matt has a question. Um, yes, you mentioned in the answer to the first question um, the importance of what you made reference to subject trained, trained or specialist trained teachers. Now we've heard concerns from several panels and in written evidence um, that there aren't enough of these specialist teachers in areas such as PSHE because of the fact that the subject isn't given such great prominence in the curriculum. Um, how do you feel the government should be addressing those concerns? Um, I think that uh, given that PSHE doesn't have uh, a statutory basis and there's a lot of views about what PSHE actually is and includes, and we've heard, you'll have heard evidence about the wide range of things that people think are within this uh, subject. It is actually quite difficult uh, to define. A number of uh, witnesses that are very supportive of PSHE being statutory still say that they would want what particular topics and issues were covered in that to be left locally. So in we had a comprehensive PSHE review and about 12,000 responses to our consultation on the national uh, curriculum. Some of the topics that people want included in the curriculum are, are first aid, emergency life support skills, looking after animals, learning to cycle. Now it's quite difficult to say that a graduate going to university and on to initial teacher training should be skilled in all of those uh, areas. I think PHE covers a range of topics and actually schools may be better advised to pick individuals that are uh, well qualified to uh, do those individual topics rather than expecting that from one uh, teacher. I mean, I was speaking to um, Melanie Syrett, who's uh, a PSHE chartered teacher at Goose Green Primary School a couple of weeks ago, and her view uh, about the practical difficulties around PSHE uh, are largely around leadership, around the importance that the leadership of the school places on particular elements of uh, PSHE. But I don't think we can expect every school to make every aspect of PSHE a priority. I was interested in a witness that said there are too many priorities on schools, but my issue should be a priority as well. And I think that's a tension that's come through in a lot of the evidence. We can't say everything's a priority, there are too many of them, but I want mine added on as well. And I think that's something that's worth uh, exploring. Okay, you, um, you spoke about how um, it should be down to schools to identify teachers who have these skills already, but actually the evidence we've been hearing has been that 
in many cases, those teachers aren't actually available to deal with the very sensitive issues such as SRE, um, drug abuse um, and other forms of abuse within the home and beyond. Um, how, I'll ask again, how would the government address those concerns? I think that uh, we shouldn't just simply look at teachers, initial teacher training or their subject uh, training. Uh, most teachers I know have a uh, wide range of interests beyond just their subject particular passion for some aspect of PSHE and there's a range of continuing professional development which is available for them. I think just because you haven't trained in a subject it would be a bit sad to say you could never develop skills and uh, the right attitude and behaviours for uh, teaching a range of additional things. Continuing professional development is something we will all have to do uh, in our lives and I think your generation may have a number of very different careers and that's down to continuing professional uh, development. So that Charter Teachers uh, uh, scheme, um, Melanie said that she's making her services and her expertise available to a wider range uh, of schools. Um, I uh, heard people talk about the um, lack of training in terms of citizenship uh, education. It costs £35 a year to join the Association of uh, Citizenship Education. That to me does not seem to be a barrier to a teacher accessing all the resources that are available uh, in relation to the teacher training on those aspects of the curriculum. Thank you. Okay. And a brief question for Lizzie. Um, we spoke to Janet Palmer, she came to speak to us. Um, she mentioned that in the future there will not going to be any subject specific inspectors, that was said. Um, you mentioned also briefly that we all expect a certain quality of education, and right so. Yeah. So how, without subject I don't know whether that's what Janet said or whether she said that they wouldn't be a three yearly cycle of PSHE inspections. At the moment we uh, inspect every single subject and there's a report about it uh, every three years, a PSHE report which you mentioned Joel uh, came out and those will be concentrated on the core subjects. But every school uh, inspection includes an inspection of um, the spiritual, moral, social and cultural development of pupils in school inspection. So that's in every single uh, school inspection. And I would expect, I mean, Ofsted are independent of the department, but I would expect uh, those inspectors to have had training on how to make those judgments about that very broad uh, development. And it should be clear if pupils are not getting uh, that wide uh, education and development that they, uh, they require. Thank you. Thank you. And now we move on to Sam's questions. What evidence do you have, if any, to suggest a link between excellent life skills provision within schools and then overall attainment? Um, I haven't seen uh, evidence myself. doesn't mean it's not out there, but um, I think, uh, in my experience, if you visit an outstanding uh, school, uh, they're outstanding beyond just their academic uh, results. You find it in the attitudes and the ethos of uh, the school and the pupils there. They have a wide range of uh, curricular activities. I visited um, uh, East Barnet uh, School, which is a technology uh, college, and they had wonderful uh, design and technology uh, provision. But actually, I talked to a couple of the pupils who have just uh, uh, come back from winning the National uh, Robotics Championships that were held in the US. And so they have a real enthusiasm for robotics, and the school has allowed them the opportunity to do that way beyond what the curriculum uh, offers. They entered two teams for, uh, for that competition, and they won. Now, they're the sorts of opportunities, I think, that uh, outstanding schools offer to their pupils, not something that we would ever prescribe in a national curriculum that every uh, child has to, has to do this. And just another aspect of the curriculum, which I don't think has been mentioned uh, sufficiently, is uh, about uh, cultural uh, development, the arts, music, um, as well as uh, sports and uh, PE. So I just want to do uh, a bit of a promotion. We've got a cultural education uh, plan coming out uh, shortly as a department, which sets out the range of initiatives that uh, we do. And I think cultural education arts, music, dance are really important ways of developing precisely the types of skills that some of the previous witnesses said they needed. 
I went to see the first show of the National Youth Dance Company. And they'd put uh, a number of uh, people on there together. Three weeks they had to prepare uh, a dance show at Sadler's Wells. Uh, the Times reviewed it and said it was uh, excellent. They demonstrated not just the knowledge and skills relating to dance, but all the attitudes that you'd want about hard work, teamwork, punctuality, taking responsibility, the creativity. So I think there are all aspects of the curriculum that you can learn those uh, skills through. And you, I've seen Tracy talk about how you can learn financial skills uh, through mathematics. So I don't think it's a, a, an either or in terms of uh, skills or um, uh, the curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. And now moving on to a question from Matt. Um, to what extent do you believe that teachers deprioritise PSHE provision in favour of other statutory subjects which may be examined and have further implications for the school? Um, I think that there's uh, probably been too much emphasis and over-focus on sometimes low-value uh, qualifications. And I think that part of that's been driven by the accountability system that's been uh, in place, which rewards schools for uh, continuing to enter pupils for modules again and again, resitting those so they can get the highest uh, mark on them. Taking 12 or 13 qualifications counts more than taking a set of eight uh, qualifications. Now, we're reforming the accountability uh, system in relation uh, to uh, schools, and I hopefully that should take some of the pressure that schools have perceived have been uh, on them. And I also think that uh, Ofsted, in terms of its inspection uh, of uh, schools, uh, would place less emphasis on just stacking up uh, qualifications. Um, and for the first time, we're going to start publishing what we call destination measures. So not just what the qualifications uh, young people got at 16 when they left the school, but where have they gone on to? What further higher education and employment have they gone on to? Again, what's the outcome of the education, not just how many qualifications people have stacked up. And I hope that destination measure becomes much more important uh, to schools in relation to uh, what uh, they focus their attention on. And if that means that uh, you limit the number of qualifications to eight, you get eight excellent qualifications, uh, but actually spend the rest of the time developing arts, music, the sorts of skills that uh, you were talking about, I think that would be all for the, all for the better. So you've spoken about how um, the government plans to maybe uh, suppress, for want of a better word, the other pressures that perhaps crowd out PSHE. What will the government be doing to elevate um, the, the standing of PSHE in the minds of teachers in schools? I think it's very difficult for by central direction to elevate uh, a particular uh, uh, subject. As we've uh, discussed Even before, PSHE... Uh, when you talk about PSHE, you may be talking about something very different uh, to me. PSHE isn't a traditional subject in the way that other subjects are. So you are probably talking about individual topics in relation to PSHE. Um, and so it is, I think, always going to be difficult for that to be taken as a whole. You heard from uh, Janet from Ofsted that one school that she visited embedded PSHE in every other subject. And she initially thought they're not going to be doing anything actually they were uh, an example of outstanding uh, practice. So I think that uh, just by the nature of it, it's going to be difficult. But I think in terms of the skills that uh, uh, part of PSHE uh, embodies, those are the uh, types of skills that will um, mean that when people go on to further higher education and employment, uh, they're like more likely to have uh, excellent opportunities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now question for Kerry? basically said that what PSHE means to one person may be completely different to the next. So could I just ask you to briefly outline what to you personally PSHE is and what it encompasses? Um, there are parts of PSHE which are statutory, so uh, sex and relationship education. We've mentioned financial education, which has got much more prominence in the new uh, national uh, curriculum, and aspects of uh, drug, uh, alcohol education, health, uh, etc. are uh, statutory. Beyond that, I think that for me, PSHE is uh, uh, something that should be determined locally as part of a wider school curriculum. I think if a school chooses to focus, say, on languages or focus on sport, both of those are legitimate ways to develop the skills that many of us have been uh, talking about and attitudes. And I don't think that PSHE provision needs to be identical 
uh, in every school. So I'm not going to say what you know, the department thinks. The whole purpose of allowing pupils, parents and teachers to work together to define their own school curriculum should be the answer to that. And if that means, beyond the bits that I've mentioned, that uh, it looks very different in different schools, I think that's, that's fine. Thank you. And the question from Izzy. Um, what would you say to those who would argue, um, you know, some life skills have to be, should be taught to everybody and everybody should learn them? What would you, how are we going to ensure that when academies and free schools have quite a lot of freedom in what they teach, how are we going to ensure that everybody has those life skills and is equipped to deal with situations in the future? Um. I mean, I don't think there's an absolute consensus around what those life skills uh, are, and I think that um, with uh, employers and with uh, further and higher education and uh, the range of cultural organisations working uh, with schools, schools will make those decisions. As we said, there's a whole list of priorities that bombard schools uh, in relation, to, and they have to make decisions on what those priorities are. And so I think that uh, beyond uh, the curriculum that we have here, that those decisions are uh, best left for schools. And you can judge that on the outcome. I mean, the Ofsted uh, inspector will look at the uh, spiritual, moral, cultural and social development of uh, young people. They will ask the young people whether they're happy uh, in uh, the school when they inspect the school. They will ask parents whether they think their pupils are developing the types of skills that are needed and that we'll have destination measures that, you know, where do they go on to in further and higher education and into uh, employment. And I think those outcomes are much better than trying to prescribe a list of uh, skills today which may not be applicable five years time or ten years time. Other priorities may uh, come up the list. Surely things such as um, sex and relationships education in light of recent child abuse allegations, relationships education specifically, should be statutory for all pupils. That I, Would you agree with that or would yeah. you say, so and we, how are we going to ensure that with uh, people who do have freedom in their curriculum? Yeah. So in, my, in response to uh, Carrie, I did mention the three aspects that uh, are statutory. So for um, uh, secondary maintained school sex uh, education is compulsory. I don't know of uh, any secondary uh, academies, I don't know if anyone else has come across any, I certainly haven't, that don't teach sex education. If a secondary school is teaching uh, sex education, they have to have regard to our statutory guidance from the Secretary of State about how to teach sex and relationship uh, education. I think the relationship part of that is important as well. Now that guidance uh, covers a range of uh, issues, including some of those that have come up uh, today about abuse and expo exploitation, issues around uh, sexual uh, consent and around uh, a stable uh, relationships. So I can send the committee that, uh, that guidance and I think it's quite comprehensive. And if a secondary school is teaching uh, sex education, whether it's a maintained school or an academy, it has to have regard uh, to that guidance. There are trickier issues in relation to primary school where there are parents, and I think you've had some of this debate before, uh, I think it is important that parents uh, have a, uh, a say in relation to whether pupils uh, in primary schools are taught uh, uh, sex education. Um, Goose Green Primary School, which I visited, had actually gone through a period of a number of years of working with parents uh, to persuade them and get rid of some of the myths about why that school thought it was important to do age-appropriate uh, relationships uh, education, and no parent has, a, has objected uh, to that this year. And so I think it's a partnership with parents in relation to primary schools. So just to conclude, sorry to summarise, um, you're saying it shouldn't be statutory, it should not be compulsory regardless of whether a school is maintained or not. So it should be up to a school to decide. Uh, for a uh, maintained secondary school, it is statutory, so they have to uh, but teach. But for unmaintained children. schools, such so, as academies? Yeah. So for academies, where they choose to uh, teach it, and I don't know of any that don't teach it, uh, they do have to follow our guidance. Now, do you I believe don't, all schools should teach it, though? Uh, I think I'd be very surprised if every secondary school was not teaching it. But do you think they should? Uh, uh, I think that... Uh, maintained schools have to. I think that academies should, but that's not the same as absolutely must. Okay. So, for instance, in our national curriculum, we've said all schools should teach PSHE. I think all schools should, all secondary schools should teach uh, sex education. Thank you. Moving on to Nikita now. 
voted against the proposed clause for the Children's and Families Bill, which would have made PSHE a statutory requirement. Can you briefly outline reasons for this? Yeah, well, um, we conducted a um, thorough review of PSHE and concluded that overall it should remain uh, non-statutory because, uh, similar to many witnesses here, um, we want to give schools greater freedom to determine their school curriculum. And so each additional subject that you make statutory take some of those freedoms uh, freedoms away. Now, I know that people, this inquiry is about uh, uh, life skills. Uh, we've been going through a national curriculum review where the historians are saying there's not sufficient time spent on history. The mathematicians are comparing how many hours are spent uh, on maths in this country compared to the best performing countries. Every single uh, subject association and group will want more time in a curriculum uh, for their particular uh, uh, subject. And as I said, PSHE does not have an agreed uh, set of uh, topics which are, uh, would form uh, this statutory um, uh, curriculum in the way that you know, we've specified for other subjects what the core of that uh, curriculum should be. But aspects of PSHE, is a, you know, there's been a lot of myths about sex education. Sex education is uh, compulsory and for maintained secondary schools. Our national curriculum does have drug uh, and alcohol education in it, and we do have financial education in the national curriculum as well. Okay, so to what extent have young people been consulted with PSHE provision in school? Um, we, uh, I looked at this before uh, I came out here. The um, consultation, unfortunately, only had five pupils uh, responding uh, to the PSHE uh, consultation, which I think we'd all agree isn't uh, uh, sufficient. I think uh, next time uh, we'll be much more active about getting the views of uh, young people. So in relation to our curriculum qualifications reform, for instance, on our GCSE reforms, we work with the British... Uh, uh, youth Council's National Scrutiny Group to get a group of young people together to talk to us about GCSE uh, reform. I've set my teams out uh, to talk to young people in relation to A-level reform. So we talked about uh, to, uh, Sheffield Futures about that. And actually we had a group of uh, young people from Linnean Bayliss uh, School come and spend uh, a day with us uh, a couple of weeks ago looking precisely at the issues of uh, uh, curriculum and qualification. So I think there's always more that we can do uh, as a department um, to make sure that young people know these consultations are happening and have an opportunity to respond to them. So what more will you now do to further embed life skills and the school curriculum? Uh, I think that's a matter uh, for schools. I think the framework uh, is in place. We've given it greater prominence in the national curriculum. We've said uh, supporting the PSHE Association to make sure uh, the resources are available uh, there. And I think that some of the changes to the accountability, i.e. looking at destination mes measures and not just how many qualifications young <coughs> people have, uh, should assist in that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And a quick question from Matt. You spoke about one of the difficulties in um, making PSHE statutory or trying to implement a sort of a, a standard level of teaching it was that it's so difficult to identify what the core areas of PSHE are. Um, why is history any different in that? You're able through consultancy with experts um, to identify the core of history. Why is it impossible to do that for PSHE as well? Uh, I'll say again, we have identified that you know, sex and relationship education, financial education, health, drugs and alcohol remain part of uh, that. I think the diff uh, difference is it would be very difficult to teach history throughout the curriculum. And I, but I think some of the life skills that you're talking about uh, here, some of the things that employers wanted in terms of attitudes about uh, hard work, perseverance, can be taught through uh, other subjects. And I think... I think that's my response to why making it a discrete subject uh, does have uh, issues and making just a set of skills a discrete subject as opposed to developing those skills through uh, other uh, uh, parts of the curriculum. Thank you. And for a question from Nathan? Um, out of interest, you just mentioned that you got five pupils to respond uh, to the consultation. Um, how did you go about that consultation and how did it fail so spectacularly? Uh, excellent question, Nathan. Um, <laughs> we put it on our uh, consultation uh, website. 
Um, there's been a lot of debates in Parliament about PSHE. You were just uh, mentioning a, a debate here. So it was a very well publicised uh, consultation. I think you'll know better than me about uh, how young people engage uh, with consultations and national uh, education debate and why they take part and why they don't uh, take part. I'm not going to, I'm too old to second guess. You know, you'll have a better. Uh, understanding of why that is, but uh, if you do have uh, anything in your final report uh, on advice to us about how we, uh, in future consultations, can uh, uh, deliberately target young people and get their views, I'd very much welcome that, because obviously that consultation shows there's more that we can do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And now to Isabella. On the practical discussion of life skills, what is the Department for Education doing to ensure that young people who aren't in the traditional school system, for example those who are homeschooled, um, to ensure that they're not forgotten? Um, when I was working on special educational needs and uh, disability, many uh, parents who are homeschooled have uh, children with SEN and uh, or disabled uh, children. Uh, what I found from uh, their forums and so on, they're actually very adept at using uh, the internet to access uh, online uh, resources. And I think uh, simple search engine, look at, uh, putting some of the terms in that you'd want to find, actually does throw up quite a lot of resources and uh, quite a number of those free resources that uh, parents could use with, uh, with their uh, children. Uh, as I said, the, uh, when I visited uh, Melanie Goose Green Primary School, she was using a BBC uh, resource as part of her lesson from iPlayer. Uh, so there are a lot of resources out there that parents uh, who are homeschooling can uh, can use. Thank you. And now to Solomon. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, we heard from Democratic Life at our first session that your department is withdrawing funding of continuous professional development for teachers. Why? Um, I think in the economic circumstances we've got, there are choices uh, to make, and some of those are tough choices. Do we take money away from schools and keep it at the department and run citizenship education teacher training, or do we leave it to schools to decide uh, what training their uh, teachers need? There may actually be uh, teachers who are very well skilled in citizenship education and don't need uh, any CPD, and taking money away from those schools and keeping it centrally uh, doesn't seem to be... Even though 40% of people said that PSHE wasn't was, was underprovided? Uh, well, it's up to... So 60% of those schools are doing a good and outstanding job and taking... And 40% aren't? No, yeah, that's right, but let me answer. Okay. The good and outstanding schools would see money taken away from uh, them to uh, fund and held centrally stuff that they're, they're actually good, uh, good and outstanding. I think the best decision, if an inspector comes round and says to a school, actually your provision's not very good on this area, is allow the school to have the resources to buy in the CPD uh, to respond to that, rather than keeping that money at the department and you know ministers or officials making decisions nationally about what should happen to that. So when you said about all schools should be teaching SRE, is that right? Um, but obviously we had the issue about ac academies and, and maintained schools. Um, in terms of whether they should all be uh, teaching, how strongly do you think that all schools should be teaching SRE? I think that's a, a scale of one to ten, maybe. Uh, I think that's, uh, I mean, statutory. Uh, again, we're back to priorities again. You can ask that question about every single subject. So, you know, art and design, music. No, I'm not, no, I'm not going to rate subjects. I actually asked about uh, SRE. So that's right. Wondering. I'm saying it, if I start rating subjects, the next question is where would I put maths? Where would I put English on a scale uh, uh, of that? As I said, it's compulsory in. Uh, uh, maintain secondary schools uh, that they should do a good job as they should do on every subject that they teach and all parts of the curriculum they should uh, put effort uh, so on a scale Alan, do you have any other questions yeah I just well I just, yeah I, okay sorry chair um so what more will the department be doing to support teachers in delivering pshe and life skills provision uh, as i've said that uh, we've put the framework uh, in Place. We've provided resources to the PSHE Association to uh, improve the resources available uh, to uh, schools. Ofsted Inspect in relation to uh, the overall uh, school's outcome for development for children. And I think we should leave it to schools to uh, access uh, those resources. Thank you, Chair. And now a question from Kerry. Um, first, 
lastly, we've heard that from a lot of evidence, in fact, that a lot of teachers kind of who have a spare space on their timetable are being made to teach PSHE. But on the other side, we've heard that actually passionate teachers are the ones that provide the excellent education. How are you going to combat this problem? Um, I think that's a, a matter for uh, head teachers and uh, teachers. If a teacher's not keen on uh, uh, picking up a particular uh, subject, it's uh, within the decision of uh, the head teacher to uh, reallocate uh, responsibilities uh, in that school. And I would ex uh, uh, expect a set of professionals, teachers and head teachers, to be a having those conversations and making those uh, decisions. I mean, uh, the best schools obviously uh, listen to pupil uh, feedback. You know, over 90% of schools have uh, school councils, there's pupil voice, uh, which um, uh, is important in schools. So if you've got a teacher that uh, really doesn't want to teach a subject and that's quite clear to the pupils, the people should raise that uh, in the school. Um, I'd also just like to briefly pick up on the last curriculum had these almost curriculum aims that were going to underpin the why the curriculum was taught. Liz Morse last week told us that to her knowledge these curriculum aims were being dropped from the new proposed curriculum. I was just wondering if you could clarify this point. Um, so uh, we can send you uh, a copy of the consultation uh, that we have. There are aims uh, in the national curriculum but obviously the national curriculum is different than it was uh, previously and so the aims have uh, adapted. Uh, reflecting the much more slim-lined uh, curriculum that we're introducing. Liz was saying that uh, last week that what the lo old curriculum did was almost give, I suppose, almost the Hippocratic Oath kind of thing for teachers, and to her knowledge, the new curriculum wasn't going to embed this. Um, you can read the aims and make your own judgement. People say different things about the aims that we have uh, in the curriculum, but I think that uh, going back to uh, what I uh, started with in terms of what life skills are and you know applies to... Uh, maintain schools and new uh, academies. I think that's about preparing pupils for the opportunities, responsibilities and experiences of later life and that applies to uh, all schools and I think that's a, a great headline in relation to uh, that. Actually, as one of the speakers rightly mentioned, this does not apply uh, to uh, academies, whereas that does. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And a question from Joel? Uh, going back to slightly touching back on Solomon's question, you said you're taking th uh, money from the 40% of schools um, that aren't providing sufficient PSH, PHRC education, and then you're putting that money into, into the more stronger subjects. Wouldn't it be um, logic to put that money that you're taking away back into the PHRC to, to make that better so they don't fail? So that 40% no. of schools aren't... Uh, uh, like are putting money into the better stuff instead of putting it onto the not so good stuff to make that as good as the other uh, subject. Perhaps I didn't explain. I think uh, the issue that uh, Solomon raised was uh, why, do, why have we cut back uh, money in relation to teachers CPD uh, for PSHE and I think my response is that we've delegated that money down to schools rather than hold it centrally in the department. Now we could reverse that and take money away from schools and bring it to the department and fund a national CPD scheme for, uh, in relation to citizenship or PSHE across the country. What that would mean is taking money away from schools that are already doing a good job of it and saying to them, actually, we've decided, we know best from the centre, hold that money centrally and then d devise CPD uh, schemes ourselves. And I think it's much better to leave that money uh, with the schools uh, to make those uh, decisions. So, you know, the argument is why don't we reverse giving the money that we've uh, given down to schools and bring it back into the department? And I don't think it's a sensible thing to do. Okay, thank you. So, um, we'd now like to ask if there are any points you haven't made which you wish to do so, and also any recommendations you would like to see as an outcome of our report? Um, I think, in terms of um, outcomes, I think it's uh, important to emphasise the local decision making between pupils, parents and teachers on determining what the best school curriculum uh, for them is. Um, I mean everyone keeps saying they want to empower uh, professionals and schools and then the next sentence they come up with a long list of things that they think it's really important that every child uh, should learn. So that conflict I think I've seen through a lot uh, of the evidence that this uh, inquiry is looking at a particular aspect of the curriculum 
you know, if next week you look at why maths teaching could be improved in the country, you'd be saying there's lots of maths things that we could do next week. Actually, our arts aren't good enough or our sports aren't good enough. The department give us a lot of money and a whole list of things on sports. So what I would like in terms of an outcome is to look for you to look through that evidence and actually say, what are the priorities in relation to this? And is it important that they're done separately or they can be embedded through other parts of the curriculum? Okay. We'd like to thank you for your time. You. Order, order. <laughs>